Open Door Baptist podcast features the insightful preaching and teaching of our senior pastor, Jason Murphy. It also comprises of special messages from a number of guest speakers throughout the year. The purpose of this podcast is to be a witness in our community, to encourage others to grow in their relationship with God through the preaching and teaching of His Word, and to serve others in the name of Jesus Christ. I'd like you to take your Bible, if you would, go to Exodus chapter 17, Exodus chapter 17, and if you don't happen to have a Bible with you today, I do encourage you to uh, use the one that's provided for you in the pew in front of you as we look into the Word of God this morning, Exodus chapter number 17. As you're turning there, I just want to mention a couple things here briefly. I know that this is a holiday weekend. Uh, A lot of families, just kind of their last ditched effort to take a little break before uh, before the school hits and what have you, and so, uh, we, but we had a great service in the early service this morning. I was encouraged uh, by the response, and, and also just encouraged by uh, seeing some uh, new families visiting and looking for a church home and folks that signed up to go to Sunday school as we kick off our campaign for Sunday school. So I was uh, just encouraged by that this morning. As you're turning to Exodus chapter 17, I want to read these to you. Every, periodically, somebody will send me a, a little email or something, and uh, I get a kick out of some of these, and periodically I'll share them uh, with the church. This one uh, says below, this is uh, letters that children have written to their pastors. Uh, this one says, I liked your sermon on Sunday, especially when it was finished. <laughs> it was Ralph, age 11. And here's one here. My mother's very religious. She goes to lay at bingo every, ch- every week, even if she has a cold. Yours truly, Annette, age nine. I like that part, of, even if she has a cold. Some of you will get that later. Uh, this one here says, my father says I, I should learn the Ten Commandments, but I don't think I want to because we have enough rules in our house already. That's Joshua, age 10. Uh, This one here says, I know God loves everybody, but he's never met my sister. (laughs) Yours sincerely, Arnold, age eight. So I get a kick out of some of those. This one here says, uh, please say a prayer for our Little League team. We need God's help or a new pitcher. Thank you, Alexander, age 10. Kids say funny things. A little boy, fascinated in his mother, gently rubbing cold cream on her face, said, Mom, why are you rubbing that cold cream all over your face? And uh, she says, well, uh, it makes me look pretty and uh, make my, makes me look beautiful. A few minutes later, she began removing the cream with a tissue. The little boy said, what's the matter? Are you giving up? <laughs> Lastly... Some of you are thankful. Lastly, a mother took her young son shopping, and after day after a full day in the stores, the clerk handed the little boy a lollipop, and the mom said, well, what do you say? He said, charge it. <laughs> he probably heard that a few times during the day. Exodus chapter 17, and I want to read just a few verses here, and then we'll have a word of prayer together. Exodus 17, and notice if you would, Verse number one, Exodus chapter 17. The Bible says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin. After their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for uh, uh, for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that you have brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and Take with thee the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand, and go. Notice verse number six. Behold, I will stand before thee, 
there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it. And the people made drink, and Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place uh, Massah and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Notice verse number eight. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time this morning. I pray that you'll Bless your word in a special way and use it today to challenge us and to encourage us and to build us up and really to help us be prudent and be prepared for our adversary at any given time. I pray if there's somebody that has graced these doors today that is not saved, they don't know Jesus Christ as their savior, that today they'll put their faith, not in church, not in religion, but in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll thank you for it and we'll give you the glory for it's in Christ's name we pray and amen. Uh, I, want, I want to mention just before we get into the message here this morning, it's great to have Justin and Rena with us. Would you maybe just stand and introduce yourself for those folks who weren't here. Introduce yourself and your wife. This is Dr. Shemish's son, Justin, and his wife, Rena. Justin, Rena, uh, from Christmas Drive, very glad to be here. Thank you. Amen, amen. Praise God. They came all the way from... Australia. What a blessing to be here for this meeting. Praise God for that. I'm glad they are here and uh, I trust the Lord uh, give you an opportunity to uh, meet them and say thank, thank you for them, to them for coming. Now I want you to notice here just a couple things here that, that come to mind as we look at this text. I want to start with a few of the types we see in here and then I want to kind of get into the practical side of the message. Would you look at, first of all, at verse number six? Look at verse six. Notice here the Bible says, Behold, I will stand before thee upon the what? In Horeb. And thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come, uh, come water out of it that my people may drink. Now keep in mind here, this rock uh, is a type of Jesus Christ. Are you with me so far? It's a type of Jesus Christ. The rock here, and, and Peter makes mention of that as well, but Moses said the rock was also in Deuteronomy a picture of God. So it's a type of Christ, it's a picture of God. And Moses does something here, he takes the rod and he smites the rock. I want you to look real quickly at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Hold your place in Exodus 17. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Turn there if you would, 1 Corinthians 10, and notice if you would, verse number 1, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse number 1, we see clearly here a type. The Bible says, moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the Red Sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat of the same spiritual meat and did drink of the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So we see God the Holy Spirit here in 1 Corinthians 10 making reference to this rock as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now verse 6, go back to Exodus 17, and verse 6 is a picture of the crucifixion, uh, where you smite the rock, and keep this in mind. I'll just show you just a quick example here. That's why we have it up here. Turn to Numbers chapter 20. Look at Numbers chapter 20, if you would. Numbers 20. And I want you to notice something here that I think illustrates this point. And I think it really is important for salvation as well. Numbers chapter 20. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. I want you to look at Numbers chapter 20. Now, Moses does something here, and the reason I'm showing you this is, is to show you how serious, when God says something, how many of you agree that we ought to take him serious? 
When he says something, we ought to know that God means what he says. Ex, uh, Numbers chapter 20, look at verse 7. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thy rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. Shall, thou shalt give to the congregation and their beasts to drink. Verse 9. Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now ye rebels. Must, ye fetch you, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Look at here for just a minute. What you see here is you see Moses' temper flaring up that you see from Exodus chapter 2 when he smote the Egyptian. Moses had a temper. Keep reading. Look at verse number 11. He disobeyed God. God said, speak to the rock. Uh, Moses paid dearly for this mistake. Moses lifted up his hand with his rod and he smote the rock. Help me out, church. How many times? So we read in Exodus chapter 17, uh, we know that Moses smote the rock and water came out. But we read in the book of Numbers that God told Moses to speak to the rock. He didn't speak to the rock. He was frustrated with the people. And Moses took his rod in his hand, the same rod that God had already performed miracles with, and turned the water to blood. And you know the plagues and all the stuff that happened and um, became a serpent and all that. Moses took that rod and he smote the rock twice. You say, well, what's the big deal? Number one, God didn't tell him to do that, did he? Number two, I want you to look at Hebrews 10, and you'll see the significance of that. And as you're turning to Hebrews 10, let me tell you, this is so important. Do you realize that, Mo that Moses forfeited his entire life, ministry's goal and plan of what he wanted to do because he broke a type in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 10, and notice here the significance of this. Some people say, well, what's the big deal? Well, do what God says. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse number 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Say the last three words. One time, Jesus Christ is to be offered as if one time, church, listen, he's to be smitten. Moses broke a type and he smote the rock who's a type of Christ twice and he forfeited his entire life ministry goal and he never went to the promised land. Look at verse 11 in Hebrews 10. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice which can never take away sin. Look at verse 12. But this man, after he had offered him again, notice, one sacrifice for sins forever sat down at the right hand of God. Isn't that a blessing? Moses took the rod and he took the, uh, went against what God said and he smote the rock Two times, the Bible says, and as a result, he forfeited his ability uh, to go into the promised land. People say, well, why is that significant? Well, it's significant because when God says something very simple, we are to do it. And, and, and you think, well, what's the big deal? He just smelt the rock. Listen, the rock, as 1 Corinthians 10 makes it clear, was Christ. And Christ has only been smitten one time, and he was smitten twice. And as a result of him breaking that type in the Bible, God says, you're done. Take God serious. Go back to Exodus chapter 17 and notice here, if you would, Exodus chapter 17, Amalek says here in uh, verse 8, and then came Amalek. Amalek was a constant thorn in Israel's side. Amalek was the first enemy to attack Israel, if you remember, after the Exodus in Numbers chapter 24. Israel was delivered from Egypt forever when they crossed the Red Sea. Listen, they could have never went back. God miraculously parted the Red Sea. They were not going to go back, even after Israel had reached Canaan. If you remember, Amalek still tormented them. Because of the wickedness of the Amalekites, God ordered Saul to totally destroy them all. But listen, this is important. Again, Saul disobeyed God. 
He did not eliminate the Amalekites. If you study your Bible, you'll see in Genesis chapter 36 that Amalek is a descendant from Esau. Okay? And so if you also read your Bible, you will also find in Exodus chapter 17, uh, look at verse number, oh, look at verse 16, I believe it is. There's verse 16. Yeah. For he said, this is God speaking, because the Lord had sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to, genera to, to generation. Amalek was the nation that God told Saul to wipe out. And he failed to do it. The king of the Amalekites, listen, was Agag. If you remember, the king of the Amalekites was Agag. And that's important because the ancestor of one of the greatest types of the Antichrist in the Bible was Haman, the Agite. And so it goes to show you uh, how important it is to do what God says when God says to do it. Now I want you to notice verse number 8. And then came, in Exodus 17, and then came Amalek. This is a picture of the flesh. This is a picture of your enemy. Let's consider this thought today as you notice in your notes and if you didn't look in your bulletin, there's a little outline for you to follow as we go through it today. This thought today, I want us to just focus on the practical side of this. And then came Amalek. First of all, when will Amalek come? When does he come? Number one, after you have been delivered. Israel had just experienced a great victory. If you remember, God had delivered from the bondage of Egypt. He led them with a the cloud by day. He led them with a the fire by night. He parted the Red Sea, the, uh, the waters at Mara, all the things that took place there, all the blessings that took place. And then I want you to see, here's Israel. They, they get this blessing. Moses hits the rock one time. Water comes out. The water's a type of the Holy Spirit. The rock is a type of Christ. And they're coming through not only great deliverance of feeding them with manna in the wilderness and cloud by day and fire by night. And then all of a sudden, a miracle takes place. And here's Israel on cloud nine and verse number eight. Look at it. The first part of verse eight. And then came who? When will he come? When will he come? After you've been delivered. Do you know what a lesson that is for us? When does Amalek come? After you have been delivered. This comes as a great shock to many new believers. They, don't under, they get saved and they're on fire and they're just like, man, this is amazing. And then comes Amalek. And they don't know exactly what to do or how to respond. They're on cloud nine. Remember, Amalek is a type of the flesh. There's, listen, listen, there's no conflict with an unbeliever. An unbeliever, they don't have any conscience about doing wrong, amen? They just do it. They just, it's just whatever. There's no conscience towards it. But when you get saved, you become a new creature in Christ, and now you have the Holy Spirit in you. And now you've got a battle, a war. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 17 that the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These two are contrary one to another. There's a battle taking place. Amalek despises the things of God and he will, he will oppose you every day. So when will Amalek come? Number one, after you've been delivered. But notice in your notes, number two, after the times of great spiritual victory. I've already mentioned Israel had just come from a great victory, the Red Sea, the man in the wilderness, water in the rock, the waters at Marah. And I say that to say this. I believe our church just came through a time of great victory. I believe that. I believe that you've been encouraged, you've been challenged, you've been built up, you've been edified, you've been renewed. Many of you were here, some of you either worked or didn't have a chance to come, but but this is the message the Lord laid on my heart right after you come from like, you know, a revival. Verse 8, and then came Amalek. I think we would be remiss if we didn't say we should be prepared and be prudent along those lines. Listen, when you feel you're on top of your spiritual world, I think it's important to look out because Amalek will come. Now, I don't say that to be discouraging, I tell you that to be prepared. 
Be prudent. Understand it. Listen, every soldier ought to be prepared for, for a battle. I remember years ago, my wife and I went to Montana. We went to a Bible conference. It was kind of a revival meeting. And we were there. It was preaching in the morning. There was preaching at night. This was years ago before we were in the ministry. And we just, we, we, we were so excited. And we were so fired up about the things of God. And we were just enamored with it. And we had talked about the ministry all the way home. I remember Monday night, we went out, let's just, let's just go soul winning. We couldn't help but tell people. And Monday night, we're knocking on doors, telling people. Tuesday night, we're knocking on doors. And, and then we're doing Bible studies, and we're just on fire. And then Wednesday, and then came Amalek. And I wasn't necessarily prepared for it. And I want you to understand, something written some 2,000 years ago, how relevant and how applicable that is to us today. And it doesn't just have to be, well, we just came off a Bible conference. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it can be anything. It can be anything in life. Amalek comes right after you've been delivered. Amalek can come right after a great spiritual victory. And I remember that coming and not being prepared for it and just being taken by surprise. I remember it vividly. That's why I titled our conference, Renewing Your Passion. Do you ever think about this? Why do we ever need to be renewed? Did it ever cross your mind? We say, well, renewing your passion. What does ever cross? I read Hosea 6, and the Bible says, uh, let us return unto the Lord. Well, why do we need to return? Where did we go? Right? Let us return to the Lord. We, we, we think of uh, Psalm 85. Uh, Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Why do we need to be revived again? Because we leak. Does that make sense for lack of a better term? You don't live up here all the time. That's why the Bible says be instant, in season, and out of season. You know, sometimes, you know, I don't feel like going to church. Go anyway. Amen. Go anyway. It's what you need. We don't abdicate our responsibility just because we don't feel like it. And that's when you become more and more susceptible. We need to expose ourselves to the meetings like we just had and to the constant preaching of the Word of God. Amalek comes after the time of great spiritual victory. Napoleon made this statement. The greatest danger occurs at the moment of victory. I want you to pause and think about that thought. The greatest danger comes at the moment of victory. See, many times we'd be like, no, that's when you celebrate. Well, yeah, okay, great. But uh, here's what I have found. I have found in the Christian life, when, when everything's caving in on you and things aren't going well, and you're kind of in a valley or in a dark place, this is what I see in Christian. I, I see this. It's on our knees and we're just like, Lord, you know, we're dependent and we're calling out on God and saying, Lord, help us out of this, this, this valley or this dark time. I mean, it's a, it's a struggle. And, and then yet, but then when you're on cloud nine, not that you're not dependent on him, but sometimes we have a tendency to forget God. That's why we sing the song, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I what? Not only that, I want you to notice in your notes, Amalek, when does Amalek come? Look at Deuteronomy 25. When does Amalek come? When you're not looking for him. When you least expect it. Deuteronomy 25, a perfect example that the Lord gave us here. Deuteronomy chapter 25. These aren't my favorite messages to preach, to be honest with you, but they're sober truths and great reminders that can help you to not be caught off guard. And it doesn't have to just be right now. It can be at any given time. Deuteronomy chapter 25. If you're already there, say amen. amen. You're there. Deuteronomy 25, look at verse 17. This is crucial because it's kind of referring back to what we're looking at in Exodus 17. Look at, remember what Amalek did unto you by the way when, when you were come up from, um, from out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble. I want you to underline this or make a note of this. 
that were feeble, behind thee, behind thee, when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. Israel was completely unprepared for Amalek. Understand, listen, as they're coming through and they're marching through and what have you, the enemy came from behind. Guerrilla warfare came from behind. The enemy came, and the Bible says, to the weak ones, and no doubt took their livestock and, 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 and everything, and to the feeble ones, as the Bible says. They were attacked suddenly from behind at the weakest place in the camp. They struck those Jews who were weary and feeble, and they were in the rear of the march. Folks, listen, that is so important to remember and to keep in the forefront of our minds. If the devil is truly a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour, who is he going to look for? He's going to look for the ones that kind of just, well, I go to church, you know, periodically, or I'm kind of just floating, I haven't found a place yet. Hey, it's been four years. Find a place. Well, I'm not sure that I agree exactly because I'm not sure if they know where the church started. <laughs> you know, or whatever. I don't like the color of their pews. I don't like, whatever, whatever. Listen, people that are church hoppers and shoppers always find something wrong with a local church. You're never gonna find any church that you agree with everything that you believe, even if you pastor it. <laughs> Amen. My list is longer than yours. So Amalek attacked Israel after experiencing a great blessing and the provision of the water from the rock. Satan knows what our weakest point is. That's why we must watch and we must pray lest we fall into temptation, as the Bible says. Listen, at no point do we have the liberty to let our guard down. Can I say this? There's too much at stake. There's too much at stake. Keep this in mind. He was after his victory over the four kings that Abraham was tempted to take the spoil. It was after Joshua's great victory at Jericho that he was overconfident. And then in Joshua chapter 8, he was defeated at Ai. Remember that. It was after, it was after Elijah had slain the prophets of Baal. And after that great victory that he did, got, you know, discouraged and deserted and went and hid somewhere under a tree and got ready to quit the ministry. And it was Jesus Christ after his baptism and that great victory in Matthew 3, Matthew chapter 4, there he is being tempted in the wilderness. Hello. And then came Amalek. He goes after the weak. You know, sometimes there's a local church and you maybe, in a church our size, and I think in Washington, uh, being one of the least church states in the United States of America, and yes, I'm biased, <coughs> we have a great church. I love our church. I love our church family. But as our church grows, and I see new families coming, and I can't get a chance to fellowship with everybody, or meet everybody, or know everybody, but, but it's weird, it's weird, um, even when I shake hands at the door, I make a note in my mind, like a mental ascent sometimes, and I think, man, I, I get a chance to spend some time with them or get to know them a little bit or whatever. But sometimes, that's one of the reasons we have 12 adult Sunday school classes. Sometimes, in a local church, attrition or folks can kind of fall out of church. And, and, and I know it in my mind, but I feel like there's nothing I can do about it, but I know how susceptible they are because that's when the devil will jump in and pounce because that's when you're at weakest, your weakest point. When you're not attached to a local church, which, which keep in mind, was not man-made. Christ died for the what? The church. So it's important. That's why it's important to stay in prayer, stay in church, stay in the word of God. Number two, notice if you would. Number two, in your notes, what do you do when Amalek comes? Go back to Exodus 17. So what do you do? So, so we know that the, Amalek's a type of the flesh, and he's a type of our enemy, and I know that he comes after great victory and after you've been delivered, and he comes when you least expect it, but what do you do when he comes? Well, notice verse number 10. First of all, you fight against him. You don't give up. You don't wave the white flag you fight against him. Notice what took place in Exodus 17, verse 10. Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. 
And Moses and Hur went up to the top of the hill. When Amalek comes, make him fight for every inch he wants to gain. You fight against him. You don't give up. You don't yield to the flesh. The Bible says in Romans 13, make no provision for the flesh. So you don't put yourself in a situation where you are exposed. What do you do when Amalek comes? You fight against him. I don't have time to really develop it or go there, but in Ephesians chapter 6, listen. What do you do when you go to battle? You put on the whole armor of what? You take the shield of faith. You put on the helmet of salvation. You take the sword of the spirit. Right? The blessed breastplate of righteousness, all, all those things, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, all of that. But sometimes people go to battle and they go to battle without having their armor on. If Amalek's going to come, which he will, what are you supposed to do? Well, you're to fight against them, but you need to fight prepared. You need to know how to go to battle. Second of all, notice in your notes, trust the one on the mountain. Look at Exodus 17 and verse 10. Trust the one on the mountain. Look at verse 10. And Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up on the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hands that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy and they took a stone and put it under him and sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed upon his hands and the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. What do you do when Amalek comes? Trust the one on the mountain. Folks, Moses here was their intercessor. As long as his hands were up, as long as they were like this, then Israel prevailed. And as he became weary and his hands came and, and, and came down, Amalek prevailed. And so Moses, Aaron and her, I heard, I heard some guy preached a message on this text years ago and he said, thanks Thank God for guys like her, which that doesn't go very well today, but, <laughs> but, yeah, his, but they helped him. He was an intercessor for them. This is a tremendous lesson for us. He was calling on the Lord while they were fighting the enemy below. The lesson is it reminds us that prayer must accompany any battle which the Lord is fighting for the believer. I'll say it again, prayer must accompany any battle that the Lord is fighting for the believer. You must be in prayer. One, one preacher said years and years and years ago, all failures are prayer failures. Prayer, real prayer, not rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, thanks for the grub, not now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul. I'm talking about where you get in that secret place of the Most High and you get alone with God and you cry out before Him and you bring your petitions and your supplications before the God of Heaven. But some people go to battle, they don't put on the armor, they don't trust the one on the mountain and they don't bathe things in prayer. And then came Amalek. Are you prepared for him to come? Are you prepared for that battle? The flesh is attacked, verse 8. We'd be remiss if we didn't pause, I think, just to, just to see the types in the text. Look, look the, again at Exodus 17 real quick. Joshua, in verse number 10, again, keep in mind, this is the first time Joshua's ever mentioned in the Bible. And he's mentioned some 250 times after that. Joshua, it means Jesus. It's a type of Jesus Christ. You have the rock in our text here in verse 6, a type of Christ. Amalek in verse 8, a type of the flesh. Here's Moses again. Look at verse 12. It's another type of Christ, a fourth type of Christ in the text. Look at verse 11 and 12. If Moses' hands are literally raised as the text states, then when he, we have a fourth picture of Christ in the passage. Watch. Our victory lies in the crucifixion where both hands are held out by nails. It's another picture you see in the text. <laughs> and yeah, I'll tell you, let me just say this. Hollywood has nothing on this book. This book is loaded. Loaded. Some people, are, some people they, they, they just, they can't, and I don't mean this offensively because I know it wouldn't be in here, but they can't stop looking for Pokemons, but, but 
but, and they think this is a boring book. You're out of your mind. This book is loaded. Amen. And God will use it to speak to you and draw you closer to him and strengthen you. Amen. Lastly, let me say here, what do you do when, Am almost lastly, what do you do when Amalek comes? You follow the one on the battlefield. Look at verse number, Exodus 17, look at verse number 13. Joshua discontented Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Joshua led the troops into battle. What a picture. We're to follow our commander. God didn't leave us here to fight alone. Does that make sense? He didn't leave us here to fight alone. And he led the way for us. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. Lastly, notice why is this so important? Why is this so important? Number one, the reality of the flesh. So you bring this message today, it's very simple, it's, very, it's a short message, I told you that. The message is this, and then came Amalek. Why is that so important? <laughs> because Amalek is real. Amalek will come and you're like, you say, well, what is Amalek? What? What is it going to be? I don't know, but God does. I don't know, but it's a reality. Why is this so important? Why is this so important? Because of the reality of your flesh. The Bible makes it clear in Romans 7 that Paul said, though good I would, I do not, and that, that which I would not do, that I do, and so on. And you see that, that war there. The spirit lusting against the flesh, and the flesh against the spirit. These are contrary one to another. Why is this so important? Because of the reality of your flesh. And it must be subdued. It must be as we see in verse number 13, discomfited. It must be eradicated to the best of your ability you, to, to get rid of it, to die to self, to feed your spirit and starve your flesh. And then lastly, why is this so important? And that is because of the consequences. The, con the, the failure of understanding the consequences, okay? the consequences of ignorance. Proverbs 22, verse 3, is the last verse we see here this morning. Proverbs 22, verse 3, the Bible says this, a prudent man, a prudent man, foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are what? Punished. They're punished. So, so preacher, why is this so important? Because of the reality of the flesh, but secondly, because of the consequences of ignorance. Uh, let, me, let me give you this analogy. Watch this. If you read Proverbs 5, 6, and 7, you'll read clearly about the, uh, the whorish woman that goes after the young man and so on. And here's what the Bible gives the analogy of the young man. He says that you, the young man who's void of understanding, the Bible says that he goeth after her, the harlot, he goes after her straightway as an ox goes to the slaughter. And he knows not it's for his life. You ever seen an ox go into a slaughter? They don't just, they're just going along. They have no idea what's coming. The Bible says in Proverbs 7, as a bird hasteneth to the snare and knows not, it's for his life, his very life. That is the analogy that's given there. But that young man, who the Bible says void of understanding, isn't prudent. You don't know be prudent for you and I. The prudent thing is to do is to understand the reality of the flesh. Understand that Amalek is real. Understand that the Bible says the prudent man foresees the evil and he hides himself. But the simple pass on and are punished, meaning you gotta look ahead and understand what's the worst case scenario that could happen in this situation. Now, uh, my last name's Murphy, and it's Murphy's Law. I live there, I have to do it all the time. It's like, okay, this is gun, I gotta put safeguards in place here. So, in all reality, but there are people that aren't prudent. They make decisions without getting counsel. Just, what are you doing? Well, I decided to do this. Did you get any counsel? I mean, the Bible is replete with verses on in the multitude of counselors, there's safety, there's wisdom. No, no, I just thought it was the best thing to do. Did you know the Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto man? Oh, yeah, yeah, I guess so. People don't look ahead. People make decisions. People lack prudence today. They don't look far ahead. They only look like Esau for the 
temporary gain of the situation. And they don't have the long look, as we call it. Years ago, I gave the analogy of that, or months ago, of the, of the, red, the red part of the rope. Just living for that little sliver, that little part, not even thinking about the eternity side, not looking ahead, just living for that little part. Folks, listen. The Bible puts a premium on not just having wisdom, but being prudent and looking ahead. If you don't, the consequences, the ramifications of those decisions are grave. The Bible says, and then came Amalek. Moses took the rod and he smote the rock and he smote it twice. He did not understand fully what was going to happen. He didn't take God serious. God told Saul, I want you to eradicate, get rid of the Amalekites. He did not do what God told him to do. And Haman, the Agite. So you have all that shown in the word of God as a result of a failure to simply do what God says. So, I think it'd be wise for us to remember that verse in Exodus 17 and verse 8, and then came Amalek.